Christ candle. This is the Christ candle we use at home. And maybe Naomi, if you could hold it for me while I get the match going. Um, all right. So some of you might be lighting your candles too. As I light this candle, we're mindful of the light of Christ that is your shot in my face. Sorry. The light of Christ that is with us, um, protecting us, <laughs> loving us. And God greets all of you this morning. Grace and mercy and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the sevenfold spirit, which is before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Jen, will you lead us in the call to worship this morning? Actually, Oliver's going to be leading us in the call to worship this morning. <laughs> Go ahead, Oliver. We gather as God's beloved children, however glad we are, however out of sorts we are. We come together as a people whom Jesus calls into community, so this becomes a place where all are welcome. We have come to give thanks, to pray and sing, to be with one another. Let us worship God. Side kids. Um, so I want to talk to you today about plans. I'm back at school um, because I'm a teacher and I'm getting ready to go back to school. So I'm doing a lot of planning right now. So I've got this big book. Some teachers might recognize this book. Um, it is a lesson planner book. So when I open up this book, it's got calendars and it's got lots of places to write all my plans for the school year for my students and ways to make learning fun. Not only that, but I also have this little booklet. And you know what this is? Sometimes we call it an agenda and sometimes we call it a planner and some kids just call it a pocket calendar. But when you open it up, Inside, it has a calendar with a place to write in your plans. And 
what you plan to do on that day and 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 how you think that you'll spend your time. So that is a planner that I'm gonna to give to all of my students and have them use. And I've got my planner and I use my phone a lot to do some planning and I'm setting up my classroom with all these plans for how we can safely um, come back to school and, and do classwork again. So I was thinking about our plans, um, especially when I read the scripture um, from Proverbs 19.21 that we are reading today in church. And it was about how, yeah, we make plans and God is ultimately in control of all those plans. So when we make plans, it's really important to wonder and to discern or understand or decide, are these plans my plans or are they my plans based on God's plan? And it's really important to remember that God's plan is always best. Now, why is God's plan always best? There's lots of reasons, but some of the important ones that I think we need to keep in the front of our mind um, is that God's plans are best because God loves us best. He loves us best. He wants the best for us. And so when he makes plans for us, those are going to be the plans that are the healthiest and the best and, um, you know, the most right the most correct path for our lives. Even when those plans don't really seem all that fun or good or healthy for us at the time. So, Following God's plans is sometimes a lot about trust, but if we can keep in the front of our brain and keep it right in front of us all along, I love that idea that um, Miss Catherine gave a number of weeks back now about walking and going on a walk and keeping Jesus in front of us. And if we can keep that in front of us on our walk, that idea that God's plan is based on a deep love for his creation, that's then it gets easier to keep walking in that direction, doesn't it? Now, a few months ago, I took my planner that looked like this and I threw it out the window and I had to do everything different because suddenly we were at home, right? I think all of us had that interruption in our plans. And that was hard and not super fun all the time. And we can do hard things. It was okay in the end, right? And here we go into a new year. Things are looking different. Some people are in smaller classes or different classes, or you have to wear a mask or, or you could, don't have to wear a mask, but you do sometimes. And it looks different. And this is maybe different than how we planned it. And it's gonna be fine. God is in control. We're gonna keep our eyes set on him and he loves us. He wants the best for us. And so we're going to focus on that plan, on following Jesus, because his plan is to love us no matter what. All right. Have a great Sunday, guys. And I will talk to you later. I need to keep going with my planning. A very important part of our, our time together every week is our, our confession before God and our, the assurance that we, that we receive from God um, of his presence, of his forgiveness. Um, and thinking about what Hillary just said about God's plans and when they're, when they're difficult and when we're doing that wondering and discerning in the midst of it, um, it can be when the plans are not fun and when they're difficult, it can feel like we don't know how to participate in God's plan. And as we lead into a moment of silent reflection, um, listen to these words from uh, Howard Thurman. He was uh, a Black American theologian, an author, a philosopher, a civil rights leader. He wrote this in 1953 in his book, Meditations of the Heart. During these turbulent times, we must remind ourselves repeatedly that life goes on. This we are apt to forget. The wisdom of life transcends our wisdoms. The purpose of life 
outlasts our purposes. The process of life cushions our processes. The mass attack of disillusion and despair distilled out of the collapse of hope has so invaded our thoughts that what we know to be true and valid seems unreal and ephemeral. There seems to be little energy left for aught but futility. This is the great deception. By it, whole peoples have gone down to oblivion without the will to affirm the great and permanent strength of the clean and the commonplace. Let us not be deceived. It is just as important as ever to attend to the little graces by which the dignity of our lives is maintained and sustained. Birds still sing. The stars combine to cast their gentle gleam over the desolation of the battlefields, and the heart is still inspired by the kind word and the gracious deed. There is no need to fear evil. There is every need to understand what it does, how it operates in the world, what it draws upon to sustain itself. We must not shrink from the knowledge of the evilness of evil. Over and over, we must know that the real target of evil is not destruction of the body, the reduction to rubble of cities. The real target of evil is to corrupt the spirit of a person and to give their soul the contagion of inner disintegration. When this happens, there is nothing left and the very citadel of the person's being is captured and laid waste. Therefore, the evil in the world around us must not be allowed to move from without to within. This would be to be overcome by evil, to drink in the beauty that is within reach, to clothe one's life with simple deeds of kindness, to keep alive a sensitiveness to the movement of the spirit of God in the quietness of the human heart and in the workings of the human mind this is, as always, the ultimate answer to the great deception. Let's pray quietly in our own hearts. Hear these words of assurance from Romans 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Amen. We're just gonna grab Paul, hold up one moment.
I know that um, Paul seems to be having a little trouble logging in and I know that Hope is trying to work with him on that. So I'm wondering, just wondering if Richard, I know he's here. Richard, would you mind to do the prayers of the people now? Would that work for you? If you're not ready for that, that's okay. I just wanna. Sure, that's okay. Yeah. Unmute it. And I see a puppy. Awesome. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, uh, Pastor Heidi, and thank you so much to uh, everyone for having me uh, back with your family. This is an entirely new thing for me. I've never done a, uh, a Zoom. I've done Zoom before, but never uh, preaching uh, over Zoom. And and so this is uh, uh, this is exciting and a uh, time to be stretched and a time to uh, to grow. I hope everyone can see me okay and hear me okay. And, uh, and so I will begin. Um, Westside friends and, and everyone else who, who might be watching and listening, I, I just want to take a, a couple of moments to talk to you about actually interruptions, being interrupted. Um, oh, excuse me, I have a phone call coming in. What terrible timing. Hello? Uh, no, thank you. I'm not interested in any uh, duck cleaning services. All right. Bye-bye. I'm very sorry about that. What a terrible time uh, to be interrupted. Uh, oh, excuse me. Somebody's at my door. Oh, it's the UPS people. Uh, yeah, just put the swimming pool in the backyard. And could you fill it for me, please? Sorry uh, about that. Uh, just uh, some deliveries happening. As I was talking about, uh, oh, come in. Yes. Can I borrow the car? No, you cannot borrow the car. You're only 13 anyway. Get out of here. Okay. Interruptions. I remember as a child waiting eagerly for my favorite television show to come on. This was before streaming services and we only had two channels at the time and sometimes in right in the middle of a program right at the best part maybe some of you can relate a news flash would come on and they say we interrupt this program with this very important announcement now as a child there's nothing more important than star wars or the amazing spider-man or whatever work of art that i was a patron of We've all either heard or said these words. Don't interrupt me when I'm talking. Of course, those interruptions, by the way, in case you didn't know, we're all a part of this sermon. <laughs> the uncanny ability, though, in reality, of telemarketers to call us or to interrupt us when we're eating dinner or immersed in a good book or doing our accounting or watching The Amazing Spider-Man or napping, or is there any good time for a duck cleaning service to call us? We are an OCD society. We are obsessively and compulsively content to stick to our scheduled routines. Heaven forbid the routine gets interrupted. Now, isn't this a sermon? Where, where's the scripture? Well, stay tuned. I think maybe we're sick to death of hearing about this. And I'll be honest with you, this sermon came to me uh, long before uh, the COVID uh, situation, but we have to admit the biggest interruption of the year, perhaps of the decade, perhaps of our, even of our lifetimes, is this COVID-19 pandemic. Not since the Great Depression or a world war have we seen the entire globe interrupted jobs and careers and vacations and church services and even family lives normality of course has been interrupted and now i interrupt this sermon with some very important scriptures i want us to look uh i'm gonna we're, we're gonna take a look at a number of scriptures um jesus's very first recorded miracle let me read this to you this of course is from uh john chapter 2 it says, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. 
When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. He said to, uh, and he said to them, draw some now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. When the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine, it did not know where it had come from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. The head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, every man serves the, uh, the good uh, wine first, and then the people have drunk freely, then serves the poorer wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. Verse 11, this beginning, beginning of his signs, his miracles, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed him. Jesus' ministry of miracles began with an interruption. His mom in a sense, interrupting him. But let's continue, because I want us to look at a couple of other passages. The next one is in Matthew chapter 4, starting at verse 35. Let me read this to you. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, and it was nearly swamped, what was Jesus doing? Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. And the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even... The wind and the waves obey him. Jesus' nap time was interrupted. And what did he do? He performed a miracle. The next one, I'm not going to read it through, but I'll paraphrase it. It's one of my absolute favorites. It's in, found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verses 40 and following. Jesus is on his way to a synagogue to heal Jairus' daughter. Now, Jairus was an official. He was an important guy of the synagogue. In a sense, if we could say it this way, Jesus was on his way to do some church stuff, some important church stuff. When he's interrupted by a woman, of all people, keep in mind, uh, during the beginning of the Common Era, and she was ritually unclean. She had been so for 12 years because she had a menstrual bleed for that long. Jesus's good, solid church ministry to an innocent child, who happened to be 12 also, by the way, was interrupted by what until then was forbidden to be touched. And what does he do? He performs a miracle and heals her. Even Jesus's arrest was interrupted in the garden, Gethsemane. Peter gets all of sorts. You can't really exactly blame him, and he hauls out a sword. I, I never really, Peter's not one of those guys I picture as carrying a sword, but anyway, um, what does he do? He cuts off a poor slave's ear, a somewhat innocent bystander by comparison. With this act, Peter is interrupting Jesus's arrest. He's interrupting Jesus's very message of peace that he had been teaching for three years and what does Jesus do? He performs a miracle by healing and creating a new ear for this poor fellow. Jesus knows how to make ears. He invented them. These are only a few examples from Jesus' life. There are so many more we could look at, in fact, where his rests are interrupted. Other things get interrupted. And in fact, I felt compelled, like I said, to write this sermon some time ago when I came across just how many miracles are manifest in the midst of interruptions. And it's not just Jesus. I think of 
Uh, the burning bush incident, in a way, was an interruption of someone who's on the lam. Moses was a fugitive for a homicide. Uh, again, another one of my favorites is Peter. Peter, the apostle Peter, interrupts a prayer meeting. Now, what were they praying for? They, Peter had been in prison, and they were praying for Peter's release. And they get interrupted by Peter, who's knocking on the door. A lady named Rhoda opens it. And they don't believe her. They think it's a ghost. Paul the Apostle's ministry was interrupted by shipwrecks and viper bites. And even his sermon, which I hope isn't happening right now as I preach, one of his sermons was interrupted by a young man falling asleep and falling out the window. And what happens? Paul raises this man from the dead. A miracle. In each of these cases, like it was with Jesus, each and every interruption had a miracle, which I find, frankly, absolutely fascinating. Now, let me close with these three very important things I gather from these stories as I, as I meditated on all these interruptions and as I look at my own and our own world today. Number one, and this is obvious, like I said, we hate to be interrupted. We hate it. I hate it especially, ironically, when we are in the middle of doing something good for God. We are hyper-focused on the task, and we are not multitaskers by nature. But I think Jesus' nature is this. Oh, that's happening too. Okay, I'll be Jesus in this situation too. I do recognize that by nature, we're not multitaskers, but Jesus is. Jesus is the one that while holding the universe in the palm of his hand, making sure that every galaxy on the macro scale and every atom and molecule on the micro scale is in place, he is also watching the little sparrow fall. While caring immensely for the thousands of children sold into human trafficking, or forced to be child soldiers. Yes, he does care deeply also about your financial pressure or the stress you're under because of exams. Jesus is a multitasker, and his work and his grace abounds. We hate to be interrupted. Jesus seemingly isn't thrown off by them, big or small. His grace abounds at every point in that scale. Secondly, the world hates it when the church interrupts it. The great separation of church and state, frankly, is a one-way street. The world will take great offense and can take great offense at the church, but ironically, it's offensive for the church to take offense at the world. Let me be clear. Jesus created his bride, the church, are you ready for this? To be offensive. That is, on the offense. He said to Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. We are to be interrupters of this world, but don't get me wrong, not with arrogance or figurative swords cutting off ears of slaves, if you, if you will, because that is just hasty defensiveness and the church can't be that way. I think we need to continue to interrupt this world with radical love. Not so much with cutting-edge technology, but with the dynamite power of the Holy Spirit. But be prepared. The world gets confused and will react. Thirdly and finally, in sort of the opposite direction, sometimes we do welcome interruptions. I remember sitting in some three-hour classes in my, uh, when I was in Bible college doing my undergrad degree. I remember one particular time after doing an all-nighter, and I'm sitting in a three-hour class, and it wasn't exactly one of the most colorful classes. It wasn't an, an exciting class at all. And I was just, uh, it was agony to sit in that, and the clock seemed to be ticking backwards, and lo and behold, the fire alarm goes off. And I remember, I couldn't believe it, out came my, the words, thank you, Jesus. Oh, glory of glories. I'm getting out of this class. Thank you for this interruption. This world needs some salt. We are the salt 
of the earth. The world needs some light. We are a city on a hill. The world needs an alternative. The church has always been the alternative, calling us aliens and strangers to those around us. Jesus' entire ministry began with an interruption at the wedding of Cana, to which he said to his mother, why are you asking me this right now? It's not yet my time. But being the multitasker that he is, being the person of grace and of wonder that he is, he did turn the water into wine. After that day, it seemed to me the bulk of his recorded miracles were often done in the context of being interrupted. My friends, the day is coming. His day, can we say his time is coming where he is going to interrupt this world. Yes, the world is in for one heaven of an interruption. That is the trumpet shall sound when Jesus comes like a thief in the night and interrupts every single one of us. And I say with John on the island of Patmos, come Lord Jesus, interrupt us. Amen. Let's pray. Our God in heaven, maybe we're not designed so much to be multitaskers, we're often so much fixed, even on the good things in life. And then the unforeseen, that which we didn't plan for, even today, Lord, uh, getting on to uh, this website, in a sense, was uh, the Zoom meeting was interrupted with some technical difficulties. But Lord, you roll with all of them because nothing occurs to you nothing surprises you, nothing, uh, you're never taken unexpectedly. You know exactly what's going to happen. And in each sing, every single situation, whether it's, it's a world pandemic or whether it's the smallest thing, your grace abounds in every situation. So for those saying, this is beyond me, I don't know how to handle this, there you are saying, I can handle it. And those who are listening today who say, my problem's not big enough. It's too small compared to what others are going through. We need to remember, Jesus, you say, my grace abounds for that seemingly small thing too. I will embrace you and lift you up because I'm a multitasker. And so thank you for taking all of our interruptions, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you give us the grace to handle the interruptions that come into our lives, the strength and even the joy and the opportunities so that you will have glory brought to your name. These things we pray and ask in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My friends, that is my very first Zoom sermon. And so I take this time now to turn it back over to everyone else. I believe we're going to sing now. So Jesus all for Jesus is next. Thank you so much, Paul.
you to Catherine for that song, to Smar and Kevin for our song earlier as well. Um, I just have a few closing comments uh, th this morning. First of all, once again, thank you to Pastor Paul for doing something new. And oh, I love how you just added the interruptions and uh, made such a memorable Zoom sermon for us this morning. So thank you so much. Um, and yeah, it really did. See, we planned that whole like Zoom issue <laughs> this morning just to go with Paul's, with Paul's uh, sermon, right? wink wink um so thank you all for your grace and just rolling with it as we keep on working out the technical kinks i'm sure we'll have more of those as we enter the hybrid online and in-person worship in a few weeks um this morning i just want to draw your attention to our offering causes this week you may give via the bridge app or um, online or drop off a check or however you want to give how God leads you today for Westside, but also the special cause you'll see in the drop down um, menu on our website is uh, for Kingston Christian School. And yes, KCS is doing a great job as, as so many schools are getting things ready for such a different year. So we certainly want to pray for them as, um, as they make preparations to start school after Labor Day. Um, also, I just want to thank you so much for praying me through this past week. I had a very fruitful week of writing. I managed to turn in five drafts of five different chapters to my supervisor. So, um, yes, thank you for the pumping of the fists. Oh, that felt good. So they're, they're drafts. There's a lot of work yet to do, but um, God has given me a lot of fruitfulness uh, through your grace, Westside. So thank you for sending me on that time. Um, and a reminder, I am really looking for your stories of God's presence. Um, for reals, like by tomorrow, if you could send me, you don't have to send me a picture or a video, you could just send me a couple of sentences about how God has been present to you, um, how, what sign of God's presence there has been. So I'm looking for like 10, 20 more of these. Would love those by tomorrow. It can be anonymous, sure. Let me know if you want it to be anonymous. I would love these from kids as well. So far I have zero kids and zero men. So I would love some men <laughs> to respond and some kids, but more women too. So um, if you could send those to me today, that would be great. I'm, I'm planning a special service for next Sunday, um, but it depends on you. So please, please help me out. And then, um, before I change the light, so I'm going to go ahead and change the light um, in a minute. But first, actually, let, let's change the light now because I think that will flow better. Then we're going to watch a little goodbye video of Susan um, because Susan wasn't able to join on Zoom this morning unless she did end up being able to get in. I think she was having some connecting problems as well. But Susan Vandenbrill is moving to BC. And so we have a little video goodbye that we filmed on Friday. But before that, I will change, you, know, you want to change the light by okay. pulling it out? God's yeah. light is with us wherever we go as the light moves from one space into many spaces. And now we'll watch this video. And then Paul, if you could give us a closing blessing um, after the video, that would be great. So I hope you can go ahead and share that video. Okay. So we are out here on Friday night outside of Susan's house. And just to make sure that we get this goodbye um, for the service on Sunday, we just decided to film it ahead of time. So um, first of all, I just wanna say how much we're gonna miss Susan. She, I know, I know. Um, she will be moving, she's leaving on Monday, moving to BC. How long is it gonna take you to get across? Plans have changed. My oh. car is being shipped and I am flying. Oh, she's flying. That's excellent. So that will be a quicker route. Yes. Well, we have made something for you that was for your car trip, but I am guessing that you're going to find ways to enjoy this as well. So Caroline Princeton put together this great Kingston bag with all, did I just whip you in the face? No, sorry. A great Kingston bag with lots of goodies for you and oh. things to remember us by. So there you go. Even Thank if you're you. not taking a car ride, it's still legit and awesome. good. And Susan has been, what year did you start coming? It's like 20, it's been a lot, most of the time that we've been here. Yeah, 
So, and during that time, this one was this thing. Yeah, <laughs> so she's been here a long time. She has taken part in, I wrote them down, but then this is not even all the things. So the Colossian Way most recently, uh, divorce care, she left that for a long time. <laughs> Uh, she was a part of Circle of Friends. She did cards for pastoral care. She helped out with the Christmas Cafe, and then this past year, she took that whole project on. Um, she helped with the Friends of Refugees team, and oh, there was one oh Freedom Session as well. She has just generated so many friendships in the church, and yes, she fostered uh, Nevada before before she became our dog. So she's a mama in her house as well. So Susan, we are going to miss you. We're going to read some you. words now. And, the, and unless you have anything else you want to say, nope. just that you'll miss us as well. And these words, are we're going to say these together. They're going to be at the bottom of the screen. So together we say, We feel sorrow in your leaving, yet we rejoice with you in anticipation of this new phase of your life. We will miss your love and support, yet we know you will add much to the lives of those who will be your new church family, as you have added much to our lives. We will pray for you and for the whole family of God. God bless you, Susan. Thank you. Virtual hugs. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much again, uh, everyone. Awesome video. And uh, just let me say this benediction over you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above here, heavenly host. Praise Father.